Right, good evening. Um, so I'm Tom Morgan, uh, I'm a conservator and restorer, and we differentiate between the two. Um, much of the work that we work on is, um, my specialisation is in sort of medieval wall paintings, but we cover all types of murals from all sorts of dates, um, going back thousands of years up to the present day pretty much. Um, I've never worked on a Peter Yates mural before, but it's um, an interesting one and will present its own challenges and things. Um, so first off, an apology um, for putting Bevin Court Islington. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's better. <laughs> well, we, we start with the building, I suppose. Um, uh, a mural painting quite clearly is paint layer put on a, on a wall surface. That plaster on the wall is part of the structure of the building. Um, and so when we look at um, the issues that face um, a painting such as this, and the reasons for its deterioration, we kind of focus initially on the, the building itself and the exterior in particular. We've got a, a structure here, as you can see on, on the left, where there's part of the drum which forms the entrance hall to the building. Um, and the mural forms this sort of diorama as you walk in and it's set between these sort of two uh, sort of concrete um, structures. One which forms the barrier on the handrail at the bottom and the other one that leads up through to the right well above the, uh, the entrance. As far as the painting is concerned, the, what it really wants is a stable environment. So a paint layer will be happy anywhere as long as there aren't too many fluctuations in the environment and the environmental conditions generally. The greatest threat um, to most wall paintings in this country is from damp, which we <laughs> have plenty of, uh, as you've seen today when you came over here. The structure itself uh, is brick with a, a gypsum plaster skim on the internal face. Uh, and then as far as we can tell, the, the, the paint layer itself is an oil paint. As you've seen <laughs> close up, the, uh, the mural itself is, has been through the walls a bit. Um, surprisingly, uh, to my eye, quite a lot of it is in good condition. Um, it's relatively sound in most areas, the, the paint layers are remarkably good. Given the, the history of the building and the fact that it, it used to be exposed to the elements at the front and there was no door there, um, it's obviously had far more exposure to the elements than most wall paintings in this country. You probably all know if you're <laughs> well versed with the building itself that it um, depicts the sort of deconstructed version of the Finsbury Arms, so the various elements are there. I don't know the arms particularly, but when I was looking into it, I saw that they, um, they were sort of put together from an earlier um, set of arms that was um, put together by the borough in, was it sort of the beginning of the century? Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And then sort of upgraded and sort of um, changed around a little bit. But it, um, it now forms this very interesting mural, that sort of, as you say, um, deconstructs the, the arms of 1931. Um, <coughs> so the, uh, the technique for the painting, um, as I've said, it's, it's painted, as far as we can tell, in oil paints. They're on this <coughs> very smooth gypsum plaster over the brick support. The brick itself um, is one brick thick, so that's nine inches. If you look at the header bricks at the top, it's sort of going across the, the structure. Um, and that roof up there, so hopefully you'll see in the next picture, um, has this uh, roof light in the centre of it and essentially that's the main area of um, deterioration, the main cause for the, the, the flaking and the, the salt crystallisation that you see here on the painting and the, the damage that you've got. During the time that we've been discussing um, what might be done with it and how one might approach the um, deterioration problems, we've also looked at the structure itself because it's in this um, curved space. There's a gap beneath the handrail which allows air to flow underneath and you get humidity build up along the bottom edge but that air is relatively well ventilated because of that gap. Up at the top of the wall where you see the, the third picture along there's a sort of yellow band there. That area is enclosed so effectively although it's an open space um, the microclimate up there will be slightly different, so you'll have trapped air. 
now that the entrance is also closed in with the door, that again sort of restricts the flow of air that might once have passed across the surface of the painting. That's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just <laughs> it's one of the factors that we look at when we're considering the way it's deteriorated. The roof light itself has leaked over the years. I've heard talk of a, a sort of river of water running down the surface of the painting at various times. And what you see in the, mid, uh, the second photograph to the left is the sort of uh, effects of salt crystallisation coming through the plaster, expanding, um, breaking up the surface of the plaster and expanding the paint layer itself. Um, in some cases we see this as a sort of, I've explained it as a, like a, a nuclear bomb blast. You have this sort of salt in the middle and all the bits of paint get sort of blown outwards. So essentially it's irrecoverable. You can't really put it back together again. The, there's a hole underneath it and the paint layer itself is, is destroyed effectively. Um, even when it's not broken up, it's often been expanded. So we tend to think of these areas as sort of sacrificial in the end. We have to sort of basically cut them out, fill the losses and retouch them. Uh, the photograph on the right shows a slightly different form of deterioration from the salt pustules you see in the other photograph and that's where we have peeling paint um, and again that's a sort of breakdown between the interface between the paint layer and the ground layer underneath it or possibly in this case there might be a not the not the plaster itself but there might be a ground layer beneath the paint layer and that's breaking down because it's had a bit of a checkered history and there's various areas of sort of restoration work some of the things aren't particularly clear and we haven't worked on it yet, so we will find out more as we go through. We've got various types of damage. One of the first things we do is to look at the, um, the surface of the paint itself and try to work out what the different forms of damage are, why they've occurred. On the left we've got clearly sort of drip marks. There's nothing on the surface now, so I can't assess what it might have been, but um, whatever it was has had an effect on the paint layer itself and dissolved it. Uh, the central photograph shows um, the surface coating which has been applied in places and that in itself has discoloured and darkened and you've got this brown smearing going on and there's quite a lot of that on the figure of the bull in particular. And then obviously on the right there are <coughs> lots of um, areas where there's been graffiti in the past, the, the names scratched into the surface and um, some of these have been retouched but the, the paint that was put over it to retouch it is sort of rather heavy and glossy and has dripped on the surface and now causes its own problem. <laughs> so part of our work would be to re remove that. Again we've got bits of the, of the, uh, the bull on the upper left there. There are areas which have been patched in, it's, it's difficult to tell now whether they're simply repairs to areas of damage in the surface, attempts at retouching, whether they were put in at first to redefine the shape never continued. It's very difficult to tell in its present state but again as we start to work on it we'll obviously start to clean the layers and, and work out what's been applied where. Um, we've got areas of vandalism which we can quite clearly see. There are quite a number of things splashed on the surface and although it doesn't show up particularly well in this image on the top right there's a sort of still a yellowy sticky goo over some of the surface which again we'll have to look at to see whether we can clean that off without affecting the paint underneath, hopefully. Uh, in other areas, particularly on the bull again, there's areas of abrasion which we see possibly um, attempts at cleaning it um, in the past, and that's cleared the surface of the original paint layer. So we've now got a much reduced surface of paint and a, a thinned paint layer back down to the, the plaster. Uh, and in the photograph on the bottom right, you also see areas of the surface coating. So we've taken the photograph at an angle and that shows this sort of semi-glossy <laughs> finish on the surface um, with the area of abrasion on the, in the centre there. <coughs> now we've got another um, example here with the various areas of, let's say, retouching, repainting of the <laughs> bull's leg on the left. Uh, one of the tasks will be to identify the different layers that we find, so what are their plaster repairs that have been smeared over the surface, whether they're bits of um, material that's been thrown onto it, uh, if it's later overpainting or the, the smeary um, <coughs> brownish surface coating that we see in some areas. We'll obviously have to look at those to see ways that we can remove those from the surface of the original mural. 
um, but without doing any damage to the, to the painting itself. Um, the other three photographs show a process where we took uh, various layers of paint off a, a painting um, and the sort of sequence shows sort of initial testing on the left with a, a cotton swab and we have a range of sort of common solvents that we'll look at and choose and judging by um, the material that we find um, we'll sort of target a list of, of solvents or reagents um, and then do small tests on those to see whether we can start to dissolve those or clear them without affecting the material underneath. <coughs> Uh, the third painting along from the left, sorry, the third photo on, along from the left on, shows a, um, an area where the black and cream colour at the bottom, which is the original, was covered by a later layer of black paint and then a layer of white paint over that. Um, this is a bit of graffiti that had been graffitied again, so it had other stuff thrown on it and painted over it. Um, and the final photograph on the right shows um, the removal of these other layers, getting back to the original paint layer but not affecting it and keeping all the detail. <coughs> Something slightly different. <laughs> um, <laughs> had to jump centuries here trying to <laughs> because we haven't obviously done any work on the painting itself, I can't show you the examples of how we might fix the flaking paint um, using the original, but we uh, <laughs> thought we'd show you this one instead. Anyway. Um, so it's the Queen's bedchamber sitting in Queen's house. Our first job was to go in there and um, sort of plot out the condition of the painted ceiling. Um, this was an assessment just like the one we carried out on the on the Yates mural um, and effectively you go around and just look at the painting in detail and here we were trying to identify areas of flaking paint in particular. Um, the museum staff had noticed two or three areas where there were flakes visible um, but what was suspected was that those flakes are obviously areas where it's curling up or falling away. Um, but we were concerned that there was a far worse problem than that. In fact, when we got up there, there was flaking all over the painting. Um, so these images here just show that sort of plotting out of the, the areas at risk. And we colour coded them as a orange and red, and the red was in serious need of immediate attention. And the orange was where we had areas of what we call blind flaking, where the flakes uh, of paint have become detached from the surface but aren't visibly flaking yet. So if you tap them they sound like a piece of paper on the table. You can hear that little noise and it's enough to show you that the paint is detaching. Um, the photograph at the bottom on the left shows a bit of curling paint um, and what we do is to um, go through a testing process where we look at the type of paint that's um, that the original's executed with and then um, go through a list in our heads of <laughs> what we think might work to try to um, fix it back. Uh, the choice is often dependent on the nature of the paint itself, whether it's a, uh, an oil paint or not, fresco, whatever, we go through a different list of different types of, of painting schemes that we might be dealing with and then try to choose uh, a fixative that's most um, sympathetic to the material that we're working on. <coughs> um, in this particular case we used a, a stable acrylic and in fact most of our materials are modern acrylics. There's been a sort of, I suppose, <coughs> a, a, a regime of sort of testing over the past 30, 40, 50 years um, of some of the materials which are now commonly used and over that time the list has become smaller. <laughs> as various things that were thought to be good have been thrown out as, as not being suitable for conservation purposes. Um, in particular, there's an idea of reversibility. So many of the things that we use, we're trying to find something that we can put in that somehow would be reversible if required. Um, now that doesn't always work, of course, if it's a flake of paint with acrylic behind it, the chances of you taking that out again are probably fairly slim, but uh, we do try to apply that principle. So the process here just to go through the sort of technical aspect is that um, we went around uh, identifying areas of flaking um, and injecting on the bottom right with a, an alcohol based solution where we tried basically to sort of improve the passage of our fixative between the paint layer and the wall 
Um, it's not always necessary, but in this case it was because um, we had all these areas of blind flaking where the paint is lifted, but there's no crack there yet, so you effectively have to make a small hole and, and inject. Um, okay, another, another view um, of the same ceiling. We've got uh, uh, a little figure on the left here. Just before we started to carry out the main treatment phase for the paintings, and uh, the, as I said, the focus was really on um, initially on fixing the flaking. But when we got up close, we realised there was quite a lot of old overpaint, um, still a discoloured varnish on the surface, and all of that was sort of adding to this sort of overall feeling that it was looking very tired, rather unhappy as a painting. Um, and rather sort of broken up in places. And the little figure on the left, I don't know if you can really make it out in this picture, but the area of the chest beneath the um, figure's face going down through its neck is a different colour. Um, and that's a small cleaning test that we carried out to see whether it was possible to remove the varnish. Um, we also did an examination using ultraviolet light as well because that's a very quick method of um, identifying areas of varnish for a start, they fluoresce in a particular colour. Um, depending on the types of varnish, you might get different <coughs> colours fluorescing, so it might be slightly more green or slightly more bluey purple. Um, but in this case, we're also looking for areas of retouching, and you can very clearly see all these dark black areas, whereas where there are areas of overpainting on top of the painting. Um, so after further discussion with <coughs> the um, Maritime Museum and the um, Royal Museum's Greenwich, we then started a programme of cleaning to remove all these later accretions and materials. And on the right, you see that picture there where we've just done a, uh, an enlarged cleaning test and there's a sort of slight difference in tone and colour and clarity of the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So that's beginning to remove all those areas of deterioration and dirt and retouching and varnish and things put on the surface. Um, Obviously, as we go through that cleaning process, it gets worse first. So, <laughs> although it's still quite a nice little figure on the left, um, you can see lots of areas where there are, um, there are little tiny bits of damage all over the surface. And those areas have been, when they were last retouched, um, the restorers literally just got a brush and repainted the arm. So, there was a lot of overpaint on the surface. Uh, and there's an example on the right of how it becomes clearer. Um, we start to get back the, the feeling of the original mall. Um, and that's again, it's one of the things that we're looking for with the, the Yates mural is to try to sort of bring back the original rather than restoring it to something it never was. Um, it will be a painting that's aged, you know, so it'll have that 60 odd years of, of weathering and all the rest of it. But what we want to do is minimise the effects of the graffiti and all the rest of it that's being put on the surface and clearly the areas of damage. And that's the ceiling after restoration. Quite a bit brighter as well because they've improved the lighting as well. So. <laughs> but, um, it gives you a, an impression of the difference it can make. Um, <clears throat> just finally, it's a, a, another example of, of where the discussions go. When we first um, look at conserving a mural, um, we did this job <coughs> in um, St Mary's Church in Cromford in Derbyshire. And there was a, a problem in the church. The church was painted throughout, so the whole of the nave and the chancel was completely decorated with um, a stencil pattern and figures um, in the 1890s. And basically what had happened is that they'd um, had problems with leaks in the roof um, and around their gutters for many years. And because the timbers at roof level um, had suffered from dry rot, um, they decided that the best thing to do was to hack off the dry rot where they found it and any plaster that they thought might be affected by it, um, particularly with this idea that they would clear away any material that, that might have strands of the dry rot going through it so that they would have a, a safe environment for any subsequent restoration. <coughs> so the image on the left showed one of the piers between the windows where they cut the saint off down to his feet um, and then replastered. Um, and so the subsequent discussion, and this is all digital, all this stuff, I and mean, we actually ended up doing the, the image on the right, but the reconstruction was done digitally first, so we showed what it would be like if you just replastered and then toned it to the same colour as the background. The next image is just a sort of pared down version of the stencil work. Uh, the fourth one brings back all the architectural decoration but leaves out the figures. 
Um, and one of the problems was that we only had very skewed images of the interior, so people had taken a few photographs and they were at bad angles and there were, you know, figures in chariots that had just gone and um, there were bits of scaffolding in the way of the photographs and so the idea was can we bring something back? Um, and the figure on the right was one of the figures that had scaffolding boards and a pole in the photograph um, and we just showed that you could digitally um, bring that back into the right shape, put it back into the niche, take away the scaffolding, put back a retouched version. Um, and if we could do it digitally, it could be done by a conservator and restorer. So in the end, they commissioned the, the full restoration of the scheme. And that's it. <laughs> that's, that's your version of the digitally <laughs> restored painting. So, there we have it. I can tell you that the mural was cleaned. <laughs> yeah. Was, was, they started to clean it in 2012. Yeah. Um, there was a, one morning as I was coming out, there were two lads there with buckets and sponges. Right. <laughs> and uh, I stopped them and said, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. And they said, oh, we told we should wash the mural. Yes. Wash it? Yes. Wash it off that. And I said, I said, no, you, you please don't do that. <laughs> Hoping not, we don't necessarily have all the answers right this minute, but um, the biggest issue has been with water penetrating through the skylight. Yeah, the, yeah. um, the structure itself is brick, the brick will take in water and the water will go into the, <laughs> into the wall. I mean, there's nothing we can do no. about that, it's, it's the structure you have. Um, it's, it's a mural in what, although there is a, uh, uh, an entrance door, it is essentially an open space. I mean, there's uh, a roof above it and there's a wall behind it, but the stairwell itself is open to the elements. Yeah. There will be a lot of um, kind of very quick um, sort of uptake of humidity in that space as the weather outside changes. If yeah. it rains, it will get wet in there and it will become much damper, more humid. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we have any way at the moment, given what it is and where it is, of controlling that. I mean, it's not in a museum environment, so we can't say we would like the, everything to be um, exactly this amount of uh, relative humidity at this temperature 24 hours a day. Um, so that probably just isn't going to happen. But um, what we can do is try to sort of minimise the effects of um, the climate as far as possible. And the starting point has been the roof repairs uh, and working Have on they that. been done that? Yes. The roof repairs yeah. and like now water. So yeah. I understand yeah, that that's was, all. That was completed in December, which is yeah. why we've left it nine months, which is an yeah. inch per month for the wall to dry out. Yeah. Right. Oh, but one of the um, ideas that's come up is that in the areas where the paint is effectively beyond it, I mean, it's peeled right back and fallen away or immediately under the skylight you've got a, a sort of rectangle of blue which is very badly affected by salts and that's all blistered up. Um, and the thought was that we could remove the defective material to expose the area underneath. So effectively you lose a small band at the top of the wall to allow preferential <laughs> drying of the surface there where it's damaged anyway. Um, and try to enclose a space because we need to, for the project to go ahead, we need some uh, protective hoarding over the, the space that we're working in anyway. Um, and to, in a controlled manner, introduce dehumidification. So mm. that would be literally for a day and then monitor it and check you know, the levels of humidity that you're drawing out. If you enclose the space, you should be drawing from the wall. So given that much of the paint is actually pretty stable, I mean, it's very stable actually, um, and on a, a very stale support, I think we're, we're sort of moving towards being happy that we can draw the humidity out of the areas where it's unstable and damaged and remove those areas, you know, as part of, an early part of the restoration effectively. Um, so the idea would be to begin that sort of ahead of any main work to the mural. Um, the, in terms of the processes that we go through, You'd normally do stabilisation work first, so you'd fix the areas of flaking paint and plaster and any repairs you need to do like that to get it stable. Uh, and then you spend quite a lot of time cleaning it because it's quite a big area and quite complex as a cleaning job. Um, and then you can start to think about retouching areas of damage and loss, um, and that includes doing the plaster repairs and finishing off the, the areas of, of damage and loss. So those bits of it 
uh, towards the end of the programme anyway. So given that we're considering a sort of two month programme for the work, that's already three months away before we start to retouch it. Um, in terms of how dry it's got to be, as we say, I mean, it's, it's, it's what it is. It's, it's a, a brick drum in the entrance hall of a building, which is affected by the elements. So there will be humidity in there all the time. And as you probably see, if you're going in and out of the building, um, in spring you get a lot of condensation because you've got a cold w surface. <coughs> Warm, moist, humid air comes in and it just condenses on the surface and that will continue to happen. We need to balance two things because we need to, one, get um, a paint system that we're happy to use. Um, and we would probably look at a range of different paints which are available to us. But we need to match the surface as yeah, well. Yeah. We need to get the surface finishes right. Yeah, yeah. So it's never quite as simple as saying, well, we just use a bit of oil paint and that will match the oil paint, you know. Um, that was a question I was dreading. Yeah, it's been six years that it's not lasted that badly. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, we don't know. Um, it's, again, it's all about the building and keeping it dry and keeping it as stable as possible. I mean, I think there's going to have to be a, a, a period of monitoring everything after the restoration work, mm. um, particularly with the introduction of glazing across the front mm. and the whole sort of microclimate in that area will change. Mm. Um, I don't know, it's difficult to say. I mean, it might be that there's enough um, of a sort of buffering effect, even from the glass, to reduce the amount of condensation you get on there, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is just keeping the water out. I mean, the, the areas which are really salt damaged at the moment, um, we're hoping to clear those areas of all material. So we would look to remove the, um, the paint that's been destroyed on the surface. It might be there still as little bits, but it's beyond it. So um, we'll remove that, we'll try to take the salts out and we'll clear the, the zone as far as possible of the salt laden damaged area. Um, so removing the gypsum and Pretty much, yeah, the idea is to sort of get the brick exposed a bit okay. and to, you know, you can't move, remove it completely though because the, um, the pointing in the bricks has got cement in it and the cement contains salt, so the salt's in the building. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> gypsum plaster is a, is a salt. Um, mm -hmm. there's, you have all these other things going on, so it's never a straightforward answer, but I mean, we're going to try to choose materials which are as stable as we can get them. Um, to do what we can to stabilise the original material that's there. So, yes and no. I mean, they they can be very long lasting in themselves. The the pigments which are used are often very stable um, and sound. The the materials which are used to produce them are often stable. Um, it becomes a bit trickier when you move into the twentieth century because. Lots of acrylics get made up. The, the, the formulas for paints are often not necessarily well known. If you don't know where it's come from, it's difficult to say what might be in that particular paint. You know, um, it might say it's an oil paint, but we don't know whether it's had other things added to it. Um, I mean, artist pigments used to be ground up and mixed with a binder of some sort, whether that be glue or oil or linseed oil or something. Um, and you'd have two more or less pure ingredients. You'd have the pigment and you'd have the binder. Um, and as long as the, the, um, the wall was well prepared, you know, it had a good chance to survive. Wouldn't um, you need to use what was current at the time? Yeah, that's it. So, you know, whatever, but we don't know out of the list of things, you know, if maybe if we went to the, to, you know, to his family, there might be an archive. I don't know. I mean, that's part of the thing which, you know, I'm sure we'll look into a bit more over time, but yes. The, the, the paint layer itself, as I said before, is actually rather stable. I mean, it's, it's pretty good, you know, as a layer. So what you do have with the original is, is, you know, remarkably sound and stable. I mean, it's obviously had a few problems, as we know. It's, uh, how do we put it? It's a complex issue, <laughs> is the thing. It's very difficult to know. Um, in this case, we, we think that... Um, the plaster layer was sized first, so it was made less porous by applying um, a glue layer to it, dilute glue layer, which soaks into the surface and makes it less porous for, for when you apply the paint layer on top. Now that layer is um, water soluble. Um, so the breakdown that we had in this case was between the upper layer 
and the layer beneath it. The, the reason I think it's not straightforward and it's complex is because here the painting had been restored 10, 20 times. And when I say restored, it had been overpainted. Mm -hmm. So it's been through the walls, the roof was missing at certain times in its history. Uh, there have been all sorts of problems with it. And <coughs> the, the painting itself was conserved um, when Queen's House was turned into a museum many years ago. Um, and some cleaning was carried out then, and quite a lot of varnish was taken off and a lot of overpaint. But beneath those upper layers were lots and lots of earlier restorations, um, and that issue was never tackled. There was never any money in the budget to do it because they were concern concerned really with the building. So, move forward 10 years or so, um, it's now a fully functioning museum and it's got all the climatic controls in it. They hang all these wonderful paintings in there. And over that time, things have just continued to dry out. So basically, the paint layer, which had sort of been through the walls anyway and was very weakened, had started to lift. Um, and that had been a sort of an ongoing process. And very often what you get is a, a situation where the, the paint starts to lift and then humidity can get into the gap between the paint and the wall, which it wouldn't be able to do if you had a, a nice, stable layer. Um, so the important thing here was to try to stabilise the paint you end up with a sort of, like a leading edge. So the, the, one of the issues at Bevan Court would be the areas where it's flaking now, you kind of want to stabilise those to stop that deterioration carrying on on that edge. I just want to thank all of you for coming out this really wet and dreary evening to um, meet Tom. Just and thank you, Tom, for... Yep. Thank you. Thank you.